Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, I have put together somewhat of a unique talk today. So the psychologists in the room may be somewhat unsatisfied when we get to the results portion. I have included no numbers. However, the philosophy individuals and theologists may be very pleased with the talk because I have infused other things, some spirituality in there, and some theory ideas since we have such a unique collection of individuals. So to let me know what type of audience I have with us today, how many psychologists do we have in here? All right, so we've got a couple. What about um, theologists? Ooh, okay, good, good. And rest philosophers? Wonderful. Oh, oh, a little. <laughs> both, both camps. Okay, good. <laughs> and the way I would actually like to run the session is for it to be interactive. There's absolutely no way that you can throw me off. So if you have a question or a discussion point at any point, just go ahead and raise your hand and we can talk about it. And I can actually be extremely flexible and move from different slides or to different points or actually talk about results that I may not even have up here in terms of the slides. So do not be shy. You can go ahead and just jump right in. And I would love that. We can have a nice energized very non-traditional little session. We don't have to wait until the end. Does that sound good? All right, so let's, let's do this then. All right, so I'm also gonna throw you off in terms of the abstract that was in there as well. So you may be expecting to see me cover controversies in personality, and so that's actually what my project does do, and I'm gonna speak a little bit to that but in terms of all that diversity that we have in this room, I'm actually gonna talk about the theory behind the things that I'm going to do for the philosophers, as well as I was collecting from two different cultures in terms of my grant project. So one, a Native American population on a reservation, youth population, as well as a Caucasian population. And so we're gonna talk about some of these cultural differences that we actually saw. And there's some very unique, interesting results, and I think some future follow-up studies that could be done, especially some gender differences that I found to be highly unique and something in the developmental literature that we don't typically see and that are pretty fascinating results. So I'd like to talk to you guys about that and kind of get your feedback and insight. And you may be wondering what this is right there, that may be like your first question. <laughs> like raise your hand, let's talk about that. Um, that is, and excuse me for butchering the pronunciation, um, I actually worked with the students and the students actually clamored to collect data on the reservation this summer because it is truly a different environment. And they loved that culture because it is completely different than what you're traditionally used to and going out and collecting data. They're like, I want to go to the nation. I want to go to the nation. And so I had students in my lab fighting to who would get to go out there. And uh, there was one young girl and she would pronunciate her name for me several, several times and I would try to get it. It was very, very long. And she would just kind of laugh at me and I finally go, Brenda, just call me Tope. <laughs> and so for the rest of the summer, I would just call her Tope. But what this is, is Mapiato Yawian, and it's pretty close. <laughs> but I have actually uh, collected data on several different reservations, as well as participated in different uh, religious and spiritual ceremonies uh, with Native Americans over in uh, Oklahoma as well. And this was actually an honor given to me it's a Lakota name, and it means blue sky woman. And so it's not the sort of thing to where, you know, you have a name, and it's Brenda, and it's translated into something. It's, it's something to where, in terms of theologians, it's something that comes to someone, and you think, 
ah, this is who you are sort of thing. It's, it's bestowed upon you as if it's something that is known and it is told to someone. So it's a very different conceptual sort of idea and it's very much ingrained in everyday society in terms of how you live your life and what you do. So I figured I would put that underneath my name that is my secondary or maybe even first name, right? So, and I guess maybe additionally, I should have put their uh, white possum as well too. I was told by a different tribe that was also my name, which again would be a huge honor. They kind of believe in everything is related to everything else. So there's a big circle. And so the four-legged and the winged are all related to each other. And so that may help us explain whenever I get to these gender differences, um, why we're not seeing maybe this discrepancy that we see in terms of the white culture between males and females. But um, they have different kind of personality traits that go along with animals. So in terms of calling people wolves or possums or, or those sorts of things, um, you have a certain sort of spiritual animal that goes along with you. And putting a color in front of it, especially white, um, would be a great honor. And I'm going to talk about white buffalo calf woman, which would be a moral exemplar within their culture here in just a little bit. And so that means great teacher. So, um, and possum itself is um, able to explore and find talent and using deception in a good way. <laughs> and you may think to yourself, deception's never good, but you have to, it's from a different cultural perspective to truly understand that. But anyway, so let's move on and actually get to some good stuff. So here is some of the stuff that I'm going to show you today in terms of the culture of character. So the structure of character. So we're going to talk about different personality traits. I am a personality psychologist. So some of the things that we kind of explored in the study as well as some of those gender differences that we talked about in terms of the different cultures. And maybe what it means to be a male or a female and why we're possibly seeing some of these gender differences. So maybe start thinking about, in terms of our culture, or maybe the culture that you're from, what it means to be a male or a female. And I'm gonna show you the results of the two different communities that we sampled, and why possibly we're getting those differences between the males and the females. So in terms of theory, so here, is the slide for the philosophers. I was talking to someone yesterday, and it was a theologian, and he told me he was told that personality psychologists do not use theories. <laughs> and I told him, who told you those horrible lies? <laughs> I said, yes, there are personality psychologists who I would say probably are not using theories, that is correct. But uh, with the work that I do, I, I do have a theory that I use, and it's actually George Kelly, the theory of personal constructs. So I'm gonna briefly kind of tell you about that theory. So in terms of personal constructs, it's this idea that we make hypotheses about our environment. So we make things that are useful to us and they're kind of these bipolar constructs, so happy versus sad, or arrogant versus humble. So we use these various adjectives or descriptive ways to describe our environment, so other people, ourselves, and then from there, if they're useful to us, we keep them, or we modify them based off of experience. So we keep going, to make them more accurate as time goes on based off of our experiences. So what this means is that each person can have their own personal set of constructs, that it may vary from each individual within this room. So we may all have 
this idea of happy or sad, which could vary and be different. Or I could ask Christian over here, and he may have this construct of outdoorsy versus homebody, and nobody else in this room may have that construct at all. So they may be very individualistic and unique. And whenever I teach my personality class, I have people fill out repertory grids, which is a technique that Kelly uses to kind of capture these personal constructs. And you can get things like foofy versus puffy and all this stuff. And you think to yourself, well, what the heck does that mean? Well, it has some sort of meaning to that individual or that person. So basically, the way that you construct the world is very much on an individual level, and there's no ultimate right or wrong. It's all with that individual. And he has a fundamental postulate as well as 11 corollaries, and I could give you an entire lecture just on that, but we won't go into all that. But basically, the idea behind his whole theory and this fundamental postulate is that Whenever you're thinking throughout your day, throughout the months and years, your world works in how you anticipate events. So you're going into work one day, maybe as a teenager, you're working at Sonic, you're running a little bit late to work, and you know your boss is in the back office, so you slip in through the side door to punch your time card, because you know your boss is a little emotionally unstable <laughs> versus, you know, maybe a little bit more calm or laid back. And you have this idea, so you anticipate that he would be the type of person who's gonna get up in your face and start yelling at you and maybe try to make you cry. And you would modify this based off of experience. Maybe he has done this to you before, and so that's why you have this hypothesis. So what Kelly is saying within his theory is that we're all scientists. We make hypotheses about our world and we test them out. We anticipate events. And if they don't come true or they fail, then we modify things based off of that experience. And we keep going and try to get more and more accurate as time goes on. And we try to keep getting better as time goes on. So I slightly mentioned the repertory grid technique as a way to kind of capture these ideas. And that's what we did in the grant project, is we had individuals fill out a repertory grid. And what that involves is you can kind of capture these personal constructs as well as provide adjectives for individuals and have them rate themselves as well as other individuals in their lives and kind of see where they're falling on these various personal constructs as well as other individuals within their life. And so what we want to know is what does personality consist of, specifically if we want to think about character, kind of what is the structure going on there. So we looked at three different structures of personality to see if it was related to virtues. So here are our structures. The first one, we looked at ideographic moral traits. So within personality, there's kind of these two ideas, ideographic meaning very specific or different to the individual. So it's kind of that idea of poofy versus fluffy or outdoorsy versus homebody, something very, very unique, specific to that individual versus nomothetic, which would be typically everybody has this idea of happy versus sad. So we would have youth from 8 to 12, as well as emerging adults from 18 to 22, complete these incomplete sentences to try to get descriptors, adjectives, hopefully some type of moral traits. So personality traits. So it's important for a good or moral person to be blank and not blank. Or a good or moral person typically acts blank, but not blank. So whenever you guys are looking at these incomplete sentences, 
what are some of the things that pop into your mind? How would you guys complete these incomplete sentences if you were sitting there in the lab or you were one of the poor little youth that I torture trying to complete these sentences? What are some of the things that come up or feels or thinks or is the type of person who what? Well, this is a jokey one. <laughs> it's good. It's important for a good person to use a theory that has kind of unfortunately disappeared a little bit in history and not only go with modern theories that are more popular. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy that one. That is good. <laughs> very, I, very good. I, I, do, I, do, I do think that the, this, con this oppositional construct idea is really under <laughs> oh, well, good, good, yes. Kelly is definitely underused, and if you're thinking repertory grid, I've never heard of that. It is not often used if you, you know, look at the UK or, you know, you go in Europe. It's, it's used over there somewhat. Um, definitely not in the States. It's Primarily somewhat used in therapy. There is some use in research as well, too, but not again in the States. Um, anybody got any other adjectives that they are just the burning? Oh, no, no, that, that's perfect. No, Kelly would tell you that's perfect. Okay. It can be a word, phrase. No, that's perfect. That actually tells you something about your personality right there. Yeah, can't be wrong. Ah, yeah, yeah. So kindness. Okay, good. I'm going to use that example here in just a minute. Perfect. Anyone else? Got anything? I think it's a moral person to be acts um, virtuously and not viciously. <laughs> you run the general labels, but, um, but you can also say, well, and not that way. Uh -huh. just, that doesn't give you the trait terms that you might be looking for. Well, no, no, well, but not badly. That works too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, you could you could even say tall and short, like whenever someone yeah. was talking. Yeah, you, you can say physical qualities if you wanted to, too. There's actually no right or wrong in terms of a personal construct. That's actually um, one of the things about it. Okay, but, okay, good. Those are good examples. We're gonna use those here in just a minute. Okay, so this would be one possible structure, right, these ideographic moral traits. And the reason that I'm terming it moral is the way that I've set up the sentences because I'm asking you in terms of a good or moral person, what do they do? But you can structure these sentences any way that you want in terms of capturing um, specific types of traits. And then of course, right? Okay. <laughs> Even if you're not in the room being a personality psychologist, maybe this is how person last night got informed that personality psychologists don't use theories, maybe, I don't know, could be a possibility. But this has been the staple in our diet in terms of whenever we think about personality, it's the big five. So of course we have our extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, and openness to experience. And so the way that we have derived these as you may or may not know, but a while back, it's this idea of opening up the dictionary <laughs> and going through all the words and kind of looking for adjectives, looking for personality terms. And long story short, almost like putting those terms within a cooking pot, stirring it around and seeing which ones kind of clump together. And it seemed like and somewhat in a subjective fashion, <laughs> which ones actually go into the pot. And it seems like, oh, there's these five clumps. And some would argue that, you know, maybe post hoc or, you know, that there is a theory behind it. But um, others would argue that <laughs> there, this isn't really theoretically based. Um, but we do have a lot of research 
out there on this. This is probably the most prevalent thing that we have in personality. So there's no real reason to not examine this and look at it whenever we're looking at character because there's so much stuff out there on it. So this would be another structure to look at. Can I ask you a question about the, about the five actions? Yeah. So is it supposed to be the case that any other trait like courageous that isn't obviously falling in one of these categories would be somehow analyzable in terms of two or three dimensions, maybe it could be correlated with, I don't know, conscientiousness and extroversion? If I am a strict big five trait uh, theorist, I would say, in terms of personality, any type of endurable trait or characteristic would ultimately fall within one of these five categories. So any behavior that you could think of ultimately somehow would fit under the umbrella of one of these five. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. <laughs> well, I would argue that yes, because I, yes. Well, I, I was just wondering where, I mean, where does this um, assumption come from? Uh, well, uh, I mean, let, let's say courageous. How, how is it going to fit under? Take what? Courageous. Courageous. Yeah. Okay, bravery. Okay. Uh huh. It's um, a good question. How, how is it going to fit? Well, I will play devil's advocate. Let's see. Quite possibly, it could fit under openness to new experiences. Um, maybe extroversion. Well, because the, I mean, you could have very introverted people who are not at all like my husband, open to new experiences, turn out to be very brave. You know what? I think that is an excellent point. That is why I would say we need to look at moral exemplar traits to really get at character. <laughs> and we advance to the next slide, and I agree with you. <laughs> so in terms of other things that we would really need to look at, and bravery was one on one of the earlier lists, but just for simplicity's sake, for one of our first rounds of study, what we did um, was to boil things down to lists of five. And so these were one of the top five in terms of what was currently looked at for moral exemplar traits. So what they did is they went out and they looked at moral exemplars, so individuals who um, were looked to or admired, um, individuals who stood up for Things um, so you're thinking of like Jesus or Gandhi, Mother Teresa, major figures. What types of characteristics do they have? And so you have things like kindness, fair, forgiving, hardworking, honest. And so you may look at some of these things and be like, well, and especially bravery, those things like that. Those may or may not necessarily fit within the framework of the Big Five. So we kind of have these ideographic traits. And it could be the case, right? You could report bravery on that first list. What is a moral person? They're brave. And it doesn't necessarily fit within the category. And I alluded to her earlier, but there she is up there, white buffalo calf woman. She would be an example of a moral exemplar within several different tribes within um, Native American uh, culture. Um, very important figure. I can tell you the story if you want me to, or tell you later when we get to the gender differences if you want. I'll, I'll wait till later. We'll keep going. Let's see if you really want to know. <laughs> okay, so then once you have all these different adjectives, I told you before you rate yourself as well as other people that you may know. And I'm really interested in role models. So I want to know if people influence you. How does the character actually develop? So what I asked youth and these emerging adults was, 
a good or moral family member that you try to be like, a good or moral friend that you try to be like, a good or moral teacher, coach, preacher, or other adult outside of your family you try to be like, a good or moral famous person that you try to be like. And then I also did kind of the reverse of these four as well. So a bad or immoral family member that you don't want to be like, a bad or immoral peer that you don't want to be like, and so on and so forth, just to kind of get an idea of what's going on with that individual within their environment, to see who may be actually related to the individual's behavior or possibly influencing them. So what are these role models? So does it make a difference with these good people or the bad people? And you always think, oh, they're running with the bad crowd. <laughs> it's the bad people who are influencing you to do bad things. Or is it the good people? Or is it the famous people? I was talking to some people earlier, and they're like, you know, is it the rock stars on drugs or NFL players, you know, doing poor things that are making children do things? Or is it actually the friends, the peers they were hanging out with? So do you guys have any inclination? I'm going to tell you the results on the next slide. But do you have any guesses on who's going to be influential or if it matters by culture? Okay, friends, okay. Or <laughs> Are you just going to say everybody's? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, well you, you are right. You are right. What, what if I asked it differently? Who would be most yeah. influential? Yeah. yeah. Well, Jesus. Like, you know, all seem like mom and dad. Wouldn't, wouldn't Jesus probably be up there? The good, the four, number four category. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, actually, a lot of the college kids report Jesus or God as the good or moral famous person. <laughs> and some of the youth do, but not quite as much as the college kids do. So in terms of the structure that we're looking at, the three that I showed you, um, if you're wondering, and we already got some resistance about the big five anyway, so I may not have to convince you that it's not only just the big five, but we actually, in terms of explanatory power of unique variants, it's not just the big five. And maybe the way I set it up, I don't have to truly convince you in terms of personality that it's not only the big five doing things. What, what, what's the um, In terms of virtuous behavior. So if you're looking at things like creativity, humility, hope, gratitude, things of this nature. Um, persistence, leadership, all of these things deemed to be, I guess it would be another structure classified as virtuous behavior. So what is actually related to these structures? So it's not just the big five traits that are sucking up all this variance and those other traits don't matter at all. They actually are able to explain unique variance. Yeah, I would love behavioral studies. I absolutely agree with you. And I think in the future, that would be a wonderful way to go. And actually within the Boys and Girls Club, I think that would be extremely possible in the future. So culturally, what is going on within the role models? So I told you, and this is just within the youth sample, so this was within uh, Manhattan, Kansas. So good upper 90% Caucasian, uh, affluent, you know, middle SES sample. And then you have um, a reservation sample, Native American. Um, it was the Prairie Band, Potawatomi Nation sample in Kansas. Um, so definitely lower SES sample. Without a doubt, whenever you're looking at the negative versus positive role models, the positive role models by far went out in terms of strength. 
if you're looking at what these youth are doing, if you're looking at honesty, um, fairness, all that good stuff, the positive role models are much, much stronger in terms of the correlations for behavior. So they were having a stronger impact. This is kind of interesting though. The next point is different culturally. The negative family member role models for the Caucasian sample actually had more of an influence. And there was almost a null result down here on the reservation. So you can kind of think about that, about maybe why necessarily that could or could not be the case. Well, before I, I jump in, I don't know, what do you guys think about that? There was absolutely kind of no correlation down here in terms of the use behavior, but there was definitely not quite as strong, but still a pretty moderate result there with the Caucasian sample. I think I just need a little bit more detail on yeah. to, maybe, uh, to be able to generate thoughts on that. So in terms of the Caucasian white sample, what, what was it that the, uh, how did the negative family man member become more influential? What were you, predi you were predicting there, the virtuous behaviors and what was the predictor? Right, right, right. So down here in terms of the role models, what you're looking at is the self-reported uh, ratings and you're looking at the role models ratings and you're looking at the relationship between the two. So whenever I say how often am I honest and how often is my positive family member honest? So how often is dad honest? How often is um, Chuck honest, my best friend? How often is uh, Miss Garden honest, my positive teacher role model? How often is LeBron James honest? my famous person, how often, and you kind of keep going like that, and you kind of find out what is the relationship between the two, who are the youth kind of more like in terms of the influence. So it's almost like I probably should have had two separate slides if you want to draw a line between the two. This is almost like a separate result up here from down here. So this is kind of looking at who are the youth more like in terms of their role models. And how did you choose who was a negative family member and who was a positive family member? They did that themselves. They said so, some is negative and some is positive. Yes, okay. they, they nominated who that would be. So they actually wrote in, um, you know, Uncle Bob or George or. So what? So the, in the example, they, the people they thought were negative family members, they are actually more similar to than the positive family members. No, no, not more similar. No. Okay. Just, just comparative to the Native American sample. So both the Caucasian sample and the Native American sample had the most uh, highest correlations to the positive family member role models in terms of influence. But whenever you're looking at the negative family member role models to see if they have any influence at all, there is an effect here to where these people are having an influence here. It's not as strong as these people, but there's no effect here for these individuals. Not even like the, the modern effect here. So basically, these individuals with the negative family members are not influencing their behavior. Does that make sense? Would one hypothesis for that be that the um, Native American population's social structure is more tribally oriented, and so the family is not as strong of a nuclear unit, and therefore family members would not be as negatively, would not have as great or a great and negative impact, although they might have a positive impact. So I, I don't know if this is making much sense at all, but the first thing I thought of was that traditionally and historically, tribes have been, I mean, Native Americans have been more tribal in their social structure than nuclear family oriented. Okay, so whenever you say more tribal oriented, how would that structure be structured? Or, or what, is, what does that look like compared to a nuclear? Well, the nuclear family, I mean, if, if there's a nuclear family unit, 
generally speaking, the father has been the authority. Ah, okay, so patriarchal. The patriarchal structure. Okay. Uh -huh. Or the parental structure of the father and the mother. But in the, in the tribe, the ultimate authority figure is going to be the chief. Ah, okay. okay. So there, there would be sort of a dilution in terms of power or, or perceptions of authority on the part of the children. Uh, in terms of their perceptions of the, the authority of the parents as opposed to the chief or the, you know, uh -huh. the tribal elders or something like that. Right, 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 right. So there would be, so like a tribal council? Is that kind of, yeah. so like more individuals who are the authority figures? Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, so I guess the, the reasoning that I would attribute to the, um, the individuals in your survey who you know, didn't show uh, influence uh, or didn't show that the negative family member had influence would be something like, well, you know, this individual, yeah, they're negative, but they're not really that important in the whole social scheme that I have, so they're not influencing me all that much. So there would be a diffusion uh -huh. of negativity. Okay, so it's almost like in terms of the community, they're somewhat downgraded or ostracized, or um, but right importance. They have other role models to kind of take their place or. Ah. Oh, how interesting. Okay, so almost like having a wider social network yeah. than over here. A wider social network and a wider network of social authorities. Ah. Of, you know, authority figures. To kind of help with maybe inappropriate behavior. Oh, yeah, I like that, I like that, yeah. That's interesting. So, good morning, we have about 10 minutes left for the whole session. So. Oh, wow. I have been just talking, talking, talking. I don't know what the last minute Oh, well, um, all right, well, we can, I don't think that many. Um, well, let's get to the gender differences, since I have been, like, um, kind of talking about that. And then we can talk about whatever you guys want. So, in terms of... What I find very interesting, even though I told you the people that you know personally is having a greater effect on what you do every day, I still think who you nominate as that favorite, favorite, famous person is something of importance. That still, I think, tells you something about your personality, even though that person's behavior may not affect what you do. I think who you write down does probably tell you something. So this is interesting in terms of this cultural difference if you're thinking about youth and gender. So developmental psychologists, right, boys play with boys, girls play with girls, and you get a little baby and you dress it up in blue, people will come in and give it, you know, guns and trucks to play with and dress it up in pink, give it dolls to play with. So when looking at the Caucasian sample, and I ask the youth, little girls, who's the famous person that you want to be like? And you get this very strong gender matching. And as a developmental psychologist, comes as no surprise, right? So I get little girls saying, Taylor Swift. Makes sense, right? Little boys saying, Triple H, wrestler. And, and you look at these examples of famous people, Right, especially, you know, kind of more media examples. These are hyper sexualized examples of masculine and feminine examples. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I did have, you know, at least maybe like one youth say, you know, Stephen Hawking. <laughs> or, you know, there are the occasion of, you know, some other different or president examples. But, you know, much more likely to get these sorts of things. But I did get some things that I would never expect in a million years on the reservation in terms of gender. This idea of gender irrelevance. 
had some girls reporting this idea of famous person that I would like to be when I grow up, LeBron James. Boy, reporting, famous person that I'd like to be when I grow up, Beyonce. <laughs> Which is absolutely wild and mind blowing, right? So the first person that you could report, maybe if I had them list a bunch of people, possibly I could think maybe some of these people coming up. Very first person that they could report and write down. Maybe, possibly maybe, a female with a basketball player, maybe if the father takes them to games, maybe. And you know, because you don't have a whole lot of female role models in basketball, maybe. But a little boy reporting Beyonce as the first person. Just absolutely fascinating. So what do you guys think about that? Do you think I just walked in here and made that up, or is that as surprising to you as it was to me? Kind of obviously, in terms of prevalence on the reservation, you did see, you know, much more likely to get this, you know, gender matching idea, but we did see kind of this irrelevance idea going on there, too. Do we, I mean, in adults, we're doing a similar thing. We're asking people who their moral exemplars are. Uh, now, uh, um, when does this work? <laughs> um, the, uh, and uh, and uh, we're finding gender seems to be the most important thing in determining who you pick. You, so even among adults, uh, you know, rather than the content of the person, <laughs> rather than who the person is, it's their gender that seems to be yeah. overwhelmingly strange. Yeah, isn't that? Fa I I was just floored, floored. Oh, no, no, the, the, the little girl that, that filled out the repertory grid, I actually interviewed her personally, who wrote down LeBron. I asked her, I was like, okay, you know, I was talking to her about the family member and stuff, and I was helping her, I was typing it in the computer, and I asked her, okay, who's the family member and, and the friend, and no, she completely, she completely understood. She goes, um, LeBron James, and I go, okay, I was like, does this look right? Is this how you spell it? She's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She completely cognizant of what I asked her and what she wanted to put down. And she actually, we were coming back the next week and uh, to get some follow-up data, and she had gotten uh, expelled for depancing. <laughs> so I was like, how curious, because, I mean, to me, that almost seemed like a behavior that you would see little boys do or a little bit more kind of aggressive. I don't know, maybe not in terms of that age because you kind of see more relational aggression. But um, and in terms of <laughs> the Beyonce thing kind of threw me off. But in terms of Native American populations, you know, boys actually have long hair. It's, it's extremely common wearing two earrings. And in terms of gender and nature and animals, it's this idea that everything is related, metakweasin, we're all relatives. So there's not an idea of hierarchies at all. And I told you about white buffalo calf woman, and that's a female who played a major role of bringing the chinupa, which is the sacred pipe, to um, a tribe who was starving, yeah.